Ernestina, thank you for being here. Thank you. My pleasure to be here. So what is the most misunderstood aspect of cryptocurrency and NFTs in general? Um, so when you're asking the question about what's the most misunderstood part, um, I think firstly, there are a lot of things that are happening out there that people don't really understand about these two um, two concepts or technologies out there. Um, I think one of the most phenomenal thing that people mostly misunderstood is what actually what it is actually by the end of the day. So what is it for? Or like that's always, always a continuous question that comes with the logic of, you know, but intrinsically what it is has been misunderstood the whole time. So a lot of people like, you know, might have a brief idea of what NFT is or cryptocurrency is through Twitter, through mm -hmm. social media, which all know, we all know, like from social media might not be the best source. Like even when I was teaching um, uh, undergrads last year, I would ask them, what's your best search engine? And they would be like TikTok. And I was like, well, it's not the most reliable source you could find, is it? Especially when it comes to new like concepts or novel ideas, for example, cryptocurrency, Web3 or decentralized systems. So I think one of the first things I do want to clarify about cryptocurrency or NFT is it is a legit um, technology out there that is incorporating idea of decentralization and finance specifically, that is providing an alternative for um, not only central banks or like banking system to adopt in the future, but also it's a technology that people can get access to through their own applications, through their own thoughts about like, you know, the whatever market out there. So I think that probably is intrinsically the most misunderstood part of um, these two things out there. So, yeah. Well, what's your background? You're in this like hyper niched space, this area of study that many people may not even know exists. So could you just yeah, speak more sure. to what you're doing? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Um, so currently I'm doing a PhD in uh, Manchester based in the UK uh, about NFT specifically. But also, I'm currently a visiting lecturer at the University of Law in Cybercrime and Criminology, and also in um, Manchester Metropolitan University in Supervising Masters in Marketing and Metaverse-related issues. So I'm very much in academia, like right now, at some point, if I call it myself that way. Um, but at the same time, I do um, own a couple of companies. I work for a couple of different companies that, as advisors, we're sitting on boards. So very intrinsically also related to uh, the industry as well. So not only in the academic side. Um, so how, like when you ask a question of how I got into the industry, I think it's a very, um, it's a long story first. It's a very long story of how I got in because I came with art background. Mm. And for a digital artist to figure out what's going on in the world or how to get into the industry, let's be completely honest. It's a very rough or tough path to um to get around even so i think at the very beginning digital arts and also in 2021 i don't know if you heard about the news um that one of the painting one of the artworks sorry the nft artwork was sold for 69 million dollars and that triggers a lot okay that changes a lot in the world and everyone starts asking the question so what is nft and what is nft art so are we giving independent artists a new opportunity to like you know start shining this world through technology so um i think i got into the industry from there and kind of shift my path from being an artist or a creative artist in um experimental video art to um currently that i'm doing more finance related or I could call it social science related as well. So yeah, it's, I try my best to cut it down so that it won't last for 30 minutes explaining how it ended up here, but yeah. For sure. No, TLDR, you're just a very busy person. Awesome. Um, it is interesting that yeah. academia has caught up to this very novel space. Mm -hmm, it, yeah. f from my perspective, and that's it's no diss to academia uh, mm. yet, but yeah. from my experience, it seems mm. like educational institutions are very stagnated yeah but yeah. in these i guess respective areas um mm -hmm. it does seem like they are the ones pushing forth um which is interesting it's kind of contrarian yeah so speaking yeah. specifically to cryptocurrency can you make a case for and against using cryptocurrency yeah sure absolutely um, so I do want to like clarify one thing before, like, you know, we go into details of like, you know, going for or against it. Um, I think a lot of the time the academias do focus on different perspectives of things. Mm 
Um, so we might not be the most commercialized people trying to approach it from like, you know, what's like, what's a market value or like, of course, a lot of the time when we're discussing finance, we're still like basically intrinsic doing something about the value, but mm -hmm. uh, it's still very different from like what the general market or the general public are focusing on. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, back to the question about uh, go for, like go for it and then against it. Um, I would say one of the biggest thing um, about cryptocurrency specifically is the very fast transaction process. And also it's very machine driven process. So cryptocurrency trading, which is based on a blockchain, the blockchain technology, which is what's different from the traditional financial systems or uh, financing is basically um, without any sort of human interactions or any institutions or organizations that exist in between. And um, you get machines to run it for you. You get machines to run this automatic contracts all the time so that it's all set there. And if you want to look it up, it's right out there. It's all like most of the time it might be open to the public as well. And in the meantime, like when you're doing the transaction, it's a very fast process uh, with a lot of money, with large sum of money um, for banking system or any sort of transaction to happen in a very short period of time. You need people to go through the clearance. You need people to go check if it's fraud or you need human interactions. And when we are talking about human, there are mistakes that has been done. And what we're doing here, basically using the blockchain system is it's a much faster, much more efficient. And also at the same time, without any human interactions or without any potential hazards that could be caused by human. So I would say that's definitely a pro, like a, like a advantage of cryptocurrency trading or um, blockchain system in general. But for the pitfalls, of course, because it's all machine driven, in the meantime, it's uh, non-traceable because police can't really trace it back. Like for example, mm. cryptocurrency or uh, a lot of the, at the very beginning, Bitcoin has been used for ransom a lot of the cases because it's not traceable. If you ask someone to send you the money and you're gonna, for example, like, you know, you hack their computer and you ask them to send them the money. And if they send it, you'll like, you know, give them the information that they want or this and that. But um, a lot of the time, because it's not traceable, police can't even investigate into it. Government can't even give process for it. You know, when you're, um, your credit card or your debit card, when you're spending money on specific things, there's a pending process. Mm -hmm. A pending process is not happening here. And there's no pending process because it's very fast with a large sum and you're just done. So a lot of the time mistakes could be done there and um, it could be used for a lot of gray industry or even just black market in general. So there are a lot of a very tricky area, which we'll probably mention it in the future as well about the regulations, what, what can be done in the future, because it is one of the biggest issue that we're mentioning and it is one of the biggest thing why people are feeling dodgy about it yeah. because it's yeah. not traceable. You don't know where it's going and you don't know who's controlling it. Or at some point you can't even make a reverse people break rat, right? And you, you know, can't it, make this decision. Yeah, yeah. For sure. Sorry to interrupt. Um, what, one of the things that I've found when talking to anyone about cryptocurrency is just yeah. this super technical on-ramp that needs to be established like you have to learn about yeah. blockchain you have to learn about proof of work proof of stake yeah. you have yeah. to learn about you know private keys public keys you have to learn how to use a yeah. wallet you have to learn yeah. that if you don't copy and paste the address the public mm -hmm. key you know exactly as you 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 know um exactly as intended then you can just be yeah. sending it into the ether to someone else entirely and it's just exactly. gone forever yeah so in 2022 we mm -hmm. had so many instances of crypto you know corruptions let's say mm -hmm. we had the terra luna collapse um yeah. i i believe the um what was the exchange that collapsed ftx Mm -hmm. That collapsed in 2022 as well. And then we had the yeah. whole mm -hmm. Sam Bankman freed fiasco. So as a Gen Z, if I were just entering the cryptocurrency space in 2022, it looks yeah. horrifying. It's <laughs> just, I would not even want to enter it. So what can yeah. you say to any Gen Z or millennial or baby boomer to kind mm -hmm. of rejuvenate interest, rejuvenate, um, I don't want to say hype because it sounds yeah. ephemeral, but rejuvenate 
understanding and passion mm -hmm. about the industry, about the space and where it can go. Yeah. I think it's, I feel like it's quite funny when you mentioned the word hype, because yeah. it is one of the most like, you know, people almost put NFT connect these two words together, these two vocabularies, so like NFT hype. Yes. And it's, it's almost like, you know, because of this year, the price and the, the market and this and that, it's gone. Yeah. Um, I think it's a very, it's a very interesting process when you even think about like the languages that people use to describe this. Mm -hmm. And my general advice for these new technologies were even not only about NFT cryptocurrency, but also metaverse, but also meta or chat GPT or AI generated contents in general is um, we're in this era, we're in this time that everything is changing so fast that it's very hard to predict what's going to happen next. All we're doing right now is to try different things at the same time. It's like, wait, mm. as long as a, you're on this big table, banquet with loads of new dishes coming in we're not entirely sure what we're doing to be frank you put potion in it you put a little bit of dirty things and then you're not exactly sure what it tastes like or you're not sure if it's healthy for you or not like for example when phone was invented cell phone like mobile phone people thought it was the most toxic thing ever because mm -hmm. kids are attached to it they're like you know they, they're addicted to it and then you get what like ipad was invented when I was younger, iPad wasn't allowed in my house because mom just told me it's harmful for you. You're not supposed to like, you know, watch it. You're not supposed to play the games because it distracts you. It is distraction. Yes, it is. Like I'm not ignoring it, but it brings a lot more potential because we can use such technologies in our daily life. But all of a sudden it's accessible to us and that changes everything. Like for example, like ChatGPT, and I was given a talk like the other week about ChatGPT in general, ChatGPT 5, or like, you know, how many, however many versions out there. At the very beginning, people are terrified because, oh my God, like someone can actually have a conversation with me or they know better than I do. But what I would say is I see this as an opportunity almost because you're having this assistance from the outside or the range of knowledge pool that could potentially help you aggressively almost it might come as a very you know aggressive thing at the very beginning because it's threatening your knowledge for it's threatening your status it's threatening your job it's threatening everything about you but by the end of the day if you know how to process it if you know how to use it properly i think it's great opportunity i think we're at the time i don't want to like promote too much about american dream i don't think it's the right moment to promote it as well sure but it is an american dream for technologies to be adopted in our daily lives because there's so many potentials because people are starting talking about going to Mars mm -hmm. and people go to Mars. And I think that's a great step. And that's like a step forward out there. From your perspective, yeah. we have all of these plates and dishes in front of us and we're trying them out, seeing which ones we like, seeing which ones we want to throw away. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately the ones that we just completely dislike and that cause a kind of you know, reaction to um, cause a reaction. These are the ones that make the headlines. These are the ones yeah. that, you know, percolate in people's minds. These are the memes to use Richard Dawkins term that mm -hmm. people retain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So after the banquet is done, what does the future of the crypto industry look like? Where do you think will kind of like what dishes to continue the mm -hmm. metaphor? will yeah. we keep <laughs> on our table and say these are the ones mm. that we think are the most valuable and will serve us in the long in the long run yeah uh -huh. i think um this this is like a general rule that i believe in life um i think with a lot of specific technologies or anything that in specific that um what i see that has a future is mostly the stuff that is most sustainable first mm. Sustainable development is very important. I know the word might sound a little, you know, the UNSG, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. This It sounds big. It sounds massive. It sounds not relatable at all. But the idea of sustainability is very, very important. I do agree. Um, this is not only coming from the environmental side of it. Like, for example, we're talking about, you know, the proof of work and proof of stake and then Ethereum trying to like incorporate this whole new way of generating stuff and then using electricity because the amount of reprimand that has been accepted, that has been like faced like throughout the years, 
not only environmental side, but also from the um, development side, like the economic side of what are the possibilities that exist in one thing. This is a very abstract saying, to be frank, especially when it comes to cryptocurrency, that um, a lot of companies, um, so every year, so I'm currently based in Manchester, so it's north of England. And in this area, we have a lot of like FinTech North, this sort of conference that going on, basically based in Newcastle or Manchester or like Leeds or areas around here. FinTech North is, um, let's put it that way, it's very different from what you normally think like, you know, Web3 conference would be like. It is more of a Web3 technology that adopt in the um, financial system, the actual financial system, the, the mainstream one or how the bank, online banking, we're thinking about how to use Web3 or decentralized or cryptocurrency or like blockchain technology in general. And I would argue that um, for a foreseeable, the upcoming for foreseeable years, it is more reliable that we can predict um, like blockchain or cryptocurrency, this search technology will be more used in the mainstream system than develop itself independently or individually. Um, because the nature of this technology is already very liberal. We could always, always like, it's a very liberal, like, you know, market oriented or market related system, um, because it's been very liberal in general to the concept. So for it to be able to adopt to the mainstream, to be able to expand it, or we call it in the entrepreneur area, let's scale it up, you need governmental interference you need mass adoption through organizations or institutions, which individuals can't really do. Hmm. There's only a limited amount of efforts you can do. Like, for example, we were saying, like, when you have a startup, um, we, me and my um, co-workers, co-founders, when we first started companies, we know exactly that, you know, individuals' power is very limited. You need communities, you need incubators, you need people in the institutions or organizations or people who advocate the idea to come together so they can build something together so that it could sustain for the next 10 years even. 10 years is a long time already for a startup as well. And for any new concepts, it works just like startups. And you need organization, you need plans, you need business um, like strategy of how it's going, NFT or cryptocurrency or blockchain in general. You also need to consider that when you want it to be developed in the future. So um, I would argue that, yes, to go mainstream, that's unavoidable. And how to go further from there, how to not lose the edginess of being cryptocurrency or the edginess of decentralized finance, that's a problem. That's where we should focus on. So, yeah. Okay, so I'd love to focus on that with you. Um, just as a small tangent, you're in Manchester. So are you a city or a United fan? Ah, oh, this is going to go very controversial. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. I'm, you're going to say okay. neither. No, I firmly support city. So like, oh, okay. Okay. It, it, it's been, they've been winning a lot these days and yeah, actually yeah. It was great as well. It was beautiful. No was way. Like, oh my God, it was crowded. <laughs> I've yeah. never seen such things before. Probably coming from and not from England. Like it's very, it's very hard to imagine it even. And until yeah. I was there, I was like, oh my god. Like, I'm just glad on. that they won the Champions League. Yeah, yeah, you definitely. Also, at the same time, they're all like surprised to say, like very not so surprised anymore. I feel like a lot of the people are much younger than me even. <laughs> and I really? was like, yeah, the player is uh, Holland. I think he's definitely younger than me. And I was like. Oh. <gasps> old at some point if you know what i'm saying like i know that there's a monster you know, oh oh right I, i've seen him like i've seen a couple of games like uh in the city stadium and i was oh, like wow. it's spectacular you, you have to come here like have you been to manchester before yeah i have not i have not you have to like do you support city or united or any other team Look, or? my favorite player is cristiano ronaldo and <gasps> Yeah, so I was a United fanboy for a little bit, but then the way, you know, Eric Ten Hag treated him, I was just, it was it was unfortunate. I don't think anyone is particularly at fault. I think, you know, everybody handled it incorrectly, but, you know, yeah, I, I'm just happy, you know, I, I'm like a, a very <laughs> loose supporter, you know, City wins. I'm like, okay, for sure. Like they deserved it. 
Yeah. Um, yeah. But I digress. So we were talking about this edginess that yep. cryptocurrency needs to retain. So mm -hmm. one of the biggest uh, or the, the two biggest terms around cryptocurrency that I see constantly thrown at the technology and the industry in general is scam yeah. and fraud. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I think on the Joe Rogan podcast with Peter Zion, he just immediately said, you know, it's just some were scams, some were frauds, uh, some were pyramid schemes or whatever. Mm -hmm. In your experience, why do so many people just dismiss cryptocurrency as being a scam or, you know, as being fraudulent? And how do we... Mm -hmm. How, how do we change the psychology around cryptocurrency and make it so that people think of certain other cryptocurrencies as scams and fraudulent, like the shit coins, and think of the actual <laughs> cryptocurrencies with depth and with actual use as yeah. different? Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's a very fair question, to be frank. And it's mm -hmm. very much related to social science as well, the sociology in general of the society and why it's becoming a whatever people call a hype or anything. Mm -hmm. So for NFT specific or cryptocurrency as well, uh, one of the, as I mentioned before, one of the biggest thing is it was on Twitter. Tw Twitter is one of the biggest plays that um, impacted the whole industry in general. Because people start talking about it and people start talking about it in specific ways. So the, um, with our data, let's put it that way, like with our daily lives, what we consume every day, like for example, TV content, or nowadays probably more social media than TV content or films, or you know, films are still a bit delayed. But the most updated uh, news we normally come from is basically social media. With social media, is you use specific words and you use specific tone to talk about things. We call it discourse, and in the academic field, it's discourse analysis as one of the method to understand not only the content of what people are talking about on social media, but also the way how they're talking about it and the impression they make on human when people are viewing things. Mm -hmm. And it, yeah, you kind of got to admit it, it's consciously, subconsciously impacting how you think about this thing. For example, like with NFT, if you take a look at the current Twitter, um, you know, contents, a lot of the time you see this tiny little diamond as emoji. And you see a format almost of how people like talk about this. It's like free drop. And then, you know, the, uh, you have like, you know, different things with the, how many amount of theorem out there and how many, you know, does it worth and which one is the most hype. And also in the same time, when you're taking a look at the marketplace for, for NFT, you'll be able to see a whole page of like, for example, OpenSea nowadays, it's one of, it used to be the biggest marketplace for nfts and also currently still is at some point if you take a look at the pages or the functions that exist on the platform um there is one specific page only for the ranks like the ranking of different nfts and the only source or the only way how they rank it is basically by the price by how expensive it is or how cheap it is and i'm not trying to like you condemning them for like doing it of course it's a marketplace if you ask any auction house or even any dealers places of course money is very important and it is their main goal to be able to drive more money in to drive more traffic in so that they could take more gas fee or they could take more you know the the function like the the, the fee that they could run the platform but in the meantime it also subconsciously change how people think about this thing it's not neutral anymore, like cryptocurrency or Bitcoin. When we're talking about this specific technology, it's completely neutral. Like It's almost like saying one thing, like a cup. It's a cup. It could be used for good things. It could be used for bad things. But if you relate a cup to, I don't know, I don't, to be frank, I don't really want to give some really nasty examples out there. But if you relate it to a very negative things all the time subconsciously and keep bringing it up and up and up and more the more and more people like trying to get into no cup through this thing instead of mm. no cup first that changes the dynamic of what I it see. is 
Yes. And if you actually, because I got into a lot of debate, to be frank, not debate also, like going out, like, because uh, you're in England, you go to pubs after work and all the time. And people ask, what do you do? And I'm like, I'm doing a PhD in NFT. And they'll be like, NFT, like, it sounds like a bit, and they will have like specific opinions. It would be like, no, I think it's a complete scam and this and that. And yeah. my approach is, I would try to ask them, do you know what it is first? Do you know what is non-fungible first? What is fungible tokens and what is non-fungible? There's a huge difference between these two first. And why it matters is very much related to the fungible and non-fungibleness in between. Can you speak and to then, that? Yeah, sure. Like, I mean, um, so non-fungible tokens, like NFT uh, in specific is... So when we're saying fungible tokens, we're more talking about like, for example, Bitcoin, that one value is exact to the, the other. So you have one coin, which is trading to another coin with the exact, exact same value. But for non-fungible tokens, everything is unique. You're not really trading with one value to another. You're using one, let's say, red photo to trade with another yellow photo there. So what it means here is because everything is so unique to one another, the value itself is determined by you or determined by the people who are trading with you. Because of that, it is at the very beginning, NFT specifically is very beneficial for arts because you don't want an artist to create the exact same thing as you. So we're all using our unique work to trade with other people. And this is a transaction that is happening. And, or of course you can use cryptocurrency to buy it. And that's a different, like intrinsically what we're talking about here is NFT is promoting uniqueness, is promoting distinctiveness from other things. And because of this, the IP law, that, that's also why a lot of the um, uh, the law school or somebody's in Manchester, they're very interested in the IP law that is related to NFT because it basically means you're having a, um, a technological reinforcement for IP here. So because one is so different from another, um, every time when you trade, you're trading this label, this IP specifically. And in the meantime, because it's generated by, or it's based on blockchain system, that every trading is unique from another. You have 64 digits to prove that this is the unique trading that happened. So you won't be able to replicate it and you won't be able to copy and paste it. What would you say to the people that just consider NFTs as a JPEG? They just say, why would you ever invest in that? Why would you ever want to trade in that or get involved with that? You can just, you know, copy and paste the image and have it. What, what, how do we get people out of that mindset? Um, I think firstly, <laughs> for many years, I've tried to stop myself from trying to argue and get them out of that thinking because people never, some, sometimes people never change. When they believe in something, they believe firmly about it. Then, of course, those are not the people that, you know, we want to appeal to you at some point. Um, but for those who have an open mind and about it, um, I think it's very important to um, recognize that we're not really trading to a specific image or a specific image. Of course, you can always just like, you know, fall in love with one. And then see as, okay, this is me. Like I see this picture as me as an identity reflection or something. And you buy it and you're like, this is what I want. It's more of you're not only buying this thing, this asset out there, you're also buying the identification of this, the ownership of this asset. Buying ownership has a different um, meaning add up to buying specific. For example, you're renting a house. You're not technically buying a house. Buying a house is having the ownership of I own the place. And it really doesn't matter if the house has been rented out to other people or not. The ownership itself means a lot more than just having this image. And also in the same time, the ownership sometimes means in the social science or sociological point of view, it's also identification for belonging. So you identify yourself as one of the group, like one of the people from this community that I advocate this idea, that I advocate this concept, that I want this to thrive, then that's a different story because you are using your action to prove that you're part of them. So not only the ownership that exists here, but also this belonging that you're seeking out there, or for some people, 
being part of this to go against the governmental control of financial system is way more important than just earning money themselves. Of course, you have people out there who are trying to be a millionaire overnight. Yeah, Different story. Very hard to comment on those, but yeah. <laughs> I don't think a lot of that happen, that those sort of cases happen nowadays anymore. So like, you know, it might happen like a couple of years ago, but these are the the most like common cases that here we're talking about. So yeah. No, oh, beautiful explanation. Thank you for that. Um, I'm I'm learning so much in this conversation as well. Is the if I asked you what the future of NFTs would be, is that different from what the future of cryptocurrency is? Because when NFTs, you know, when the artwork was sold for sixty nine million dollars, mm -hmm. a bunch of articles spawned of the next five things that NFTs can disrupt or change. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I think one of those that people had a big problem with was medical records that you could just put your medical records into an NFT and yep. then store that on the blockchain or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So is this plausible and practical to you? Is this just the hype getting the, getting to people? So what does the future of NFTs look like to you? Okay. Um, so about the medical record thing, I think it's very, mm, I think a very positive mindset to think about it like that. Okay. It, great try. I, I would, if it's happening, I would be the first one to advocate it. Um, but also at the same time, I think it's very, it's quite important for us to notice that like, who are the people that are having, owning these records first? Do we want it to be individual thing or do we want to be an organizational thing? Do we want the hospitals to own the like knowledge of this or what specifically is the drive out of it? Like a lot of the time when we're discussing if something is plausible or something is possible or not, we're more talking about like who's doing the thing first or who's benefiting from it and how are we going to use it? Of course, it's all practical things. And also the same thing applies to like, you know, the chat GPT when a lot of universities reject it straight away. You got to think about what's the goal for universities to reject it. Firstly, university, a lot of the time, even though it's higher education, it is very much a process of training you how to write thesis as well, critical thesis. And you got to admit it, it's it's part of their goal. And if you use ChatGPT to think it back, basically they're helping you way too much than you should to train yourself. And you're basically not training it. You write a perfect thesis, which is, of course, you can always do that when you graduate or when you can always do it like if you need it, but it's the lack of that meaning of training you to do specific things. So when we're talking about like, you know, NFT, what's the goal? Like who's benefiting you? What the goal of it is to leave track of, leave trace of something. Then of course we have the blockchain system to do it or we have this technology to do it, of course. But firstly, who's controlling it? What sort of information is going to be open to public? because it's going to be very sensitive. One of the biggest things we're always talking about in research is also ethical reviews, ethical applications when you, before you do research. So how the data can be accessed and how the data can be shared, who can get access to those? Because with NFT, very easy to see a lot of things as well. Even the 64 digits, it might not mean a lot to normal people, but for some people, you can actually track it down sometimes. You can even find the IP, like the address for it. And I think it was earlier this year, someone was in Bali Island having a vacation and things happen, like tragic things happen because of, well, there has been like, you know, like questions about what actually happened, but there also raises questions about how can we secure these data and how can we use it properly? And for NFT specifically, if it's, I, I would say, like, I still stick to this, statement that has a lot of potential CS, but we need governmental interference at this point or regulations right now for it to be able to form in a relatively healthy way because it could easily go off track like off track and the moment it goes off track it it's already caused a couple lives out there so yeah like uh I want to ask you about Web3 in the metaverse, and then I'll come to how do we regulate these technologies as a yeah. whole. So Web3, we hear nothing about Web3 now. Yeah. Uh -huh. Like the, the news cycle around Web3 has totally died. Maybe I'm consuming the wrong 
or maybe I haven't consumed the correct mm -hmm. sites. What is just for the layperson? What is Web three? What does Web three aim to accomplish? Mm -hmm. And where is it in terms of how? Why is it not here yet? Okay. Um, so Web3 here, we're specifically talking about the decentralization of everything, pretty much. That it's a more general content about um, that you're, that, so what we're saying like Web1, Web2, or Web3, Web2, we're talking about social media, for example. You're using use of Facebook, you can post things, but the programmers behind it are going to be able to get access to your data or can control if you can post it or not. So this is what is Web2 for, that you have someone in the background helping you to form, even though you can express your ideas. And for Web3, you're the independent, you're the individual that is controlling whatever is happening to your world. And this very much fits into the idea of what we're, you know, you were mentioning about the metaverse as well, that this immersive virtual world that everyone is getting on it. Firstly, it has to be a world as well. That's why I was saying like, um, currently there's no applications or there's no world exists yet like currently you know we're in this 3d world touching you know like the the, the sofa or like you just see the window you see the sunshine it's not really happening right now as metaverse because firstly technology is not there there are not a lot of users there are not a lot of the um the programmers or the people who are like trying to create it has not yet come to the stage but um what well, what exactly we seen right now with Web3 and uh, with Metaverse or the sort of um, the virtual, the complete independent or um, the complete anonymous uh, world is it also opens up a door for us to start thinking about where the social media or where the website or where the internet is going to. Um, of course, we're saying specific technology matters. Yes, it matters. But the idea of complete control, also the complete, without interference, this concept exists very much in the core. And it's also like, well, it's almost the same thing that we were talking about before, about like, you know, cryptocurrency and blockchain system, that decentralization, not being controlled, this sort of rebellion feeling is very very down to like you know people's mind at some point when we say the metaverse i think we immediately mm -hmm. think of meta yeah will, will there be different metaverses and will they coalesce mm -hmm. into each other or will i have to pick between you know the apple metaverse or the microsoft metaverse or yeah, uh -huh. meta's metaverse which seems <laughs> redundant in saying yeah yeah it is to be it is very redundant. <laughs> <laughs> it just it sounds a bit ridiculous, not gonna lie. But it yeah. It does. <laughs> I mean, um, so for a metaverse in like um as we were saying, like it has to be a universe. A universe is not gonna be like, you know, labeled by different companies in general. Mm -hmm. So none of the companies are actually doing the job of having a metaverse. They're advocating the idea, yes, but we're living in the world that different applications is doing their own thing. Like for example, if you use MetaQuest as a goggle, um, you're able to get access to a lot of different applications. You can get in the applications to socialize with people, almost like a world, mm -hmm. but not entirely. It's you still need login. You still need to almost like go into uh, get your phone on the app store, and then you try to get like you know different applications. You get into it, you immerse yourself with some friends, and then you play games, cooperate each other, and then. But by the end of the day, is it a universe? Nah. I wouldn't really call a phone a universe as well. And it wouldn't really call Apple store to be like a universe mm -hmm. as well. So ultimately, is it gonna all oh, gonna be emerged into one, one immersive, one complete universe that has everything come together? And that's where it differs. So hopefully we don't have to like, you know, um, hopefully in the future we can have like a whole platform that could do everything, but at least currently. MetaQuest 2 doesn't really accommodate other like goggles and it wouldn't really accommodate each other as well. So, yeah. Are you excited for this transition? Uh, this transition um, towards having a metaverse? Because it feels like the bandwidth between me picking up my phone or engaging with you on my laptop, it, it feels 
more natural than not being able to escape it. And mm -hmm. I think that's what freaks people out is not having that ability to put the phone away or to turn the laptop mm -hmm. off and having everything, their entire lives in cyberspace. Yeah. So does that weird you out? Is that intimidating or is it exciting? Um, I would say from my personal experience. So because I'm currently in another research um, about XR and uh, psychology, basically a psychology wow. education as well. So what we do is that we look through different apps, like different uh, through the goggles, different virtual immersive like apps, um, like going through different experiences. You get meditations there, you get apps that are made for only like um, meditate in a virtual space, or you do specific experience, like using the visual contents or the audio contents to have specific experience. And I'm not gonna lie, every day, I limit myself down to two hours of using it and that's it. For my research hours the rest of it are going to be like you know trying to type it out or like you know, write up or have some new conclusions or anything but two hours currently is the maximum what you can do in this virtual world because firstly from so like again from a so sociological point of view you are um we need we need interactions we need physical interactions we need to be able to observe people's facial expressions and we need to almost touch them sometimes the skin touch is very important actually in human interactions and using metaverse or a lot of virtual applications is not really helping, hmm. even though it feels like they're right in front of you, but you're not getting that touch. And this like feeling of separation or isolation is there. You can't ignore it. And so for human relationships to be built or for interactions, for any meaningful interactions that's going to happen, in the future or people like you know try to have some thoughts about oh you know what like during next time if there's another pandemic we might be able to like you know talk to people through that way and it might be an alternative for us to like you know connect with other people but the actual psychology behind it or the actual sociological sources is not really supporting that idea it's not really making it physical or it's not really happening let's put it that way so I'm not entirely negative, feeling negative about it, mm -hmm. but also it's not really the most, most positive experience for now, at least. Sure. So, yeah. so a lot of work has to be done with these technologies in order for it to be more accommodating for people. Exactly. Okay. At least it's an optimistic view on yeah. it instead of just super pessimistic and dystopian, which a lot of people think yeah. that these technologies will, will empower. It's just dystopia and you know, people just living their lives in cyberspace and XR. Yeah, I think like there, there are a couple of series out there like Black Mirror or Inside Number Nine or, you know, a couple of sci-fi always focus on these sort of things. But also you got to like understand the entertainment industry in general is trying to trigger some sort of emotions from you and it, exaggerating those emotions and happiness. Yes, of course, is a good feeling and it gets you, you know, this warm feeling of everything, but it's not the most powerful emotion that a human have what do we have anger anger is one of the biggest fear why do we talk about anxiety nowadays because anxiety drives us to do things because i don't want to be die off of hunger so i eat so it's like a the, the process of um, why they're trying to drive you to think in specific ways where why they approaching technology using this creative you know like uh, videos or movies or a series why are they specifically trying to get you irritated or anxious mm. about it is because of that, because it's powerful. It's people are going to like it. We're going to be like, Oh my God, I feel actually, I'm really quite concerned about it. And it's what they want and it's impacting you as well. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. So would regulating these technologies and by these technologies, I mean, cryptocurrency, NFTs, web three as a platform mm. and the metaverse, Yep. Uh, or we'll say XR, devices mm -mm. would regulating these technologies be beneficial or detrimental mm. um i think so far so far the positive regulations that we could predict i guess um is mostly the regulations and it's not losing the core idea of what it actually is for for example what three you don't want to lose the agenda of like decentralization or cryptocurrency. You don't want to lose the non-government interference 
core idea, which is quite funny because it's complete opposite side right now. You want to figure out a way to try to like weave it through so it's not completely on the other side, but also you have enough, um, you build enough trust for bigger companies or, you know, the fintech companies to be able to adopt these technologies to benefit more people, to benefit more people than just a few or to a, be able to use it in a big broader way. And that's, um, we always say like startups, yeah, some startups has great ideas, but it wouldn't go far. It wouldn't be able to scale it up because you don't have the power in itself as a small thing to like keep growing without any help from the outside. So this applies as well. So you need a stronger hand to support you there. And this is also like, it, it, this applies to a lot of things, economy in general, like capitalism even. Like you still need government interference for medical care or or probably for some places, currently not really. <laughs> well, in the UK right now, we got GP and everything. It might be a bit slow sometimes, but it's <laughs> it, it's still working, I guess. Like I get my medications after a long time but it's yeah a bit of a set story but like it they is still show it is. up yeah 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 i'm tearing up right now honestly like <laughs> with the amount of time i'm waiting for uh, if i'm having too thick i really don't know where to go to so like, oh to tell the i can here like yeah i'm trying to be very healthy right now <laughs> i like how you say all these things but you're still smiling it just oh, shows yeah. what kind of person you are so Life it is. Yes. <laughs> one of the problems, and I'll just be, um, I'll just offer some pushback just to yeah. spice up the conversation. One of the problems I see with regulating, we'll just use the umbrella term crypto, yeah. is that it's meant to give users or individuals sovereignty. It's meant to restore sovereignty. Yep. And so if one were to say, let's regulate it, you're regulating it by like regulation is centralization in a sense, because you're having yeah. small groups of people saying, no, you can only use these technologies in this way. So it's kind of like if we're even beginning to discuss regulation about these technologies, we're already losing the ethos of those technologies themselves. Yeah. So. From my perspective, it seems like the only way to regulate these technologies without losing the decentralized aspect of them is to inspire the communities around these technologies to come up with those solutions. So how do you, just, just as a broad question, how do you inspire Gen Z or the crypto community to begin discussing how to use these technologies in a safe, responsible, secure, and ethical mm. way. In other words, how do we inspire communities to regulate these technologies themselves and not have to defer to, you know, traditional antiquated centralized institutions mm -hmm. or organizations? Yeah, mm -hmm. um, I do definitely agree with the self, the the governance, the self governance, or, or you call it the sovereignty of like the communities there. Um, as for example, like for cryptocurrency or the uh, Bitcoin in general, of um, the the DAO community out there, which they come up with their own like their programming, the contracts, and they write up contracts and they modify it and they make it all public so people can see and try to understand each other if. What are the concepts or even with the very beginning satoshi was still releasing some ex explanations of what he actually means um, about specific you know concepts and stuff i think it's very important for us to realize that it's still a very limited amount of people that actually know how the technical framework works there and because this small group of people are running this bigger community um you always get people that are a bit People come with different intentions. Hmm. You can always assume everyone comes with good intentions, of course, to build this community, to regulate it, to make it bigger. But also you get people to try to find the loophole so that they could benefit from it. And this happens a lot. And the loophole itself is, of course, like, you know, like when we're talking negatively about finances, you're almost doing the same thing like with private equity and stuff like you're kind of finding this new, like, um, 
you're going around about from like actual regulations so that you could find the potential lucrative points to get money out of it. And if this is a drive, it's unavoidable um, that things will go collapse. For example, right now, there are a lot of things, the FTT, the FTX, um, what he was doing is completely non-negotiably wrong, of course. And he was sending the money to his girlfriend, which is like, mm. with any companies, you probably don't want to do that as well. Like with any accountant, it's not even about like cryptocurrency or anything. It's about any any companies that you're running, you don't really want to do that. So I think because these things uh, came out and because these people are existing still, and you get this, um, I think there's this lady from, I'm not entirely sure where she's from, but like she might be from Russia or like um, Ukraine or something. Um, she was supposed to be the queen of like, she was being considered as a queen of cryptocurrency at some point. Mm -hmm turn out to be like a complete scam almost mm -hmm. and these people exist and they figure out a business model for them is to find the loophole or find the hype and then do it it is not helping so if it's not helping you get more people losing way more money than they should be then we need something for it like some governmental interference there to ensure that okay this is not correct or how can we prevent it from falling too far? We could always like, um, there is there is a bit of a very soft landing point here that you could always argue that no government experience is good. Yes, of course, it's very, you know, vigorous market. It drives people from doing things, but at the same time, we need a bit of a bottom line mm -hmm. from the world. And that will be the potentially like a better solution, I would assume. Yeah. So, so could you foresee a world where the crypto community themselves enforce their own regulations as as individuals as part of the collective? But if certain people do not um, meet those expectations or those regulations, then we can have uh, the consequences be enforced by governments. Is that would, possible? Yeah, I could see that coming, to be frank. Cool. I would see that to be a way more sustainable way of seeing it. Yep. <laughs> so we, we talked about human connection in regards to the metaverse. So I guess we're we're in the the love section to use Lex Friedman's uh, you know terminology. So we on call previously talked about dating apps yeah. in mm -hmm. relation to Gen Z. Are dating apps a positive or a negative for Gen Z? What are your thoughts on these, and how should we be thinking about dating apps? Um, I think, I think it's a very interesting topic, not gonna lie, because my previous research was on dating apps specifically, hmm. and I find it very interesting to see, um, the human inter interactions happening online or through web two to web three and dating apps in general, because currently we're still talking about web two, like applications, you swipe and you meet with someone and you go for a date and this and that. Um, I think it's a very in general, like from the social science point of view, it is a, it creates more opportunity for people to fold the space. So, okay. So there are a couple of elements that exist in social science when people build connections. The first thing is identity. So do you know who you are and do you want to show the person as who you are to the person that you want to be attracted to? And how do you have this identity interaction between one another? That's one of the biggest thing. And then space, space interactions, like we talked about before, you exist in the same space, you have physical touch, you um, have this eye contact, or you are looking at the same thing in the same direction. And then you got interactions, which is basically the, not only language interactions, but also physical interactions and any interact interactions that's happening. Um, so for dating apps, it changes the way, firstly, people, how people could meet and location-wise, space-wise. So now you can just start a conversation with someone online and there's no restrictions of this distance. To be frank, you can always do like 10,000 miles or it doesn't really matter as long as, well, of course we say in social science, more cases, uh, more successful cases happen only if you meet in person, which of course there was exceptions as well, but it creates opportunities first. And also with dating apps, um, you form, you are able to form this new identity that you want for yourself or for other people to attract others. So the identity could be, and also for Web3 that we're also arguing that if you're in metaverse, 
not only you can be a human, you can also be a cat or a dog. You could be a complete cat if you want. And the other person really likes a cat, which sounds a little weird, not gonna lie, but no offense this, to furries. And it, but it it is like you know a possibility that you can have a tail now all of a sudden. And if you want ears, you can have an ear as actually who you are. And you could start building this relationship in metaverse as a person with ears and a person with tail and see how that goes on because that is building a completely different type of relationship as what we are seeing right now as couple relationships, monogamy or like, you know, polygamy or any normal relationships that exist currently in the, in the real life. So this all creates very vibrant relationship building process and it creates more possibilities to discover that can we have more relationships types, not only polygamy, monogamy, also anything that is kind of mm, in between or further, yeah. or it all, it's all creating possibilities. So yes. So do you foresee a future where two people meet and one has cat ears and cat tails, one has dog ears, dog, uh, uh, and a tail maybe from a bear yeah. or something mm -hmm. um, and they prefer meeting in the metaverse because of those features and prefer not to meet in real life so they kind of have an exclusively online or exclusively xr relationship is that a possibility i feel like even asking that is redundant because it's yes but what does that do to one psychology how, how does that how would that affect someone? Okay, so I think personally, yes, it is. <laughs> if you're describing the situation, it might happen. Like it the world happen. is way too big for anything yeah. impossible to happen. And it will happen at some point. Yeah. And um, what is that to do with actual relationships that we're facing nowadays? Um, so when we're talking about like, okay, so the majority, we're not the majority, but like a lot of the time when we're talking about relationships, we're still talking about monogamous um, relationship. Um, with the criteria that, okay, also when we're discussing infidelity, hmm. we're trying to be very specific, even when we how to define infidelity, hmm. uh, it has been a question in social science, in interrelationship study even. So that raises kind of the questions of digital space and does it count of, as infidelity or does it count as uh, it is a form of relationship, of course. It is a form of interactions, but does it count as any legal interactions or any mm, interactions that could potentially impact? If if it's potentially impacting your daily life, that should be, of course. I would argue that should be like a legit relationship in that case. Is someone engaging in OnlyFans or a, an equivalent service a form of infidelity? Yep. Oh, that does it count as infidelity or are you yeah that it, it seems like this has become a very common thing where relationships are being really affected by uh these services um yeah the adult film industry as well even so how, how are we supposed to think about infidelity when using technology and having ever increasing access to technology and even you know bringing more forms of ai into it you can create your own partner, or you can create the perfect hyper-stimulating thing to look at. We'll just say it like that. So is how would someone think about infidelity if my partner is looking at those things? Do I have a right to feel cheated on? Um, how, do, how do I even go about talking to them and, and dis discussing my feelings? If it's, yeah. uh, it's such a strange thing to even ask it, but I'm, I'm excited to hear yeah um at some point like because the technology provides so many opportunities of uh, you know any potentials it, it's almost suited for anything that you want to customize you, you want to create this person and you will create it yeah. without any problems um in the meantime i think okay so firstly when we're talking about using specific server for example only fans or any other websites or film like uh products um, it is very important to notice that relationships are very, very uh, much a private thing. It's a very personal thing. Um, my personal take on this is um, if you and your partner agrees with it, do it. 
doesn't matter. It's really not any other people's problem. It's like when we're talking about sociological point of view out of it, it's more about sociology. Sociology is basically a study of society, of groups of people, how they interact with institutions or societies in general. It's not about individuals. Individuals mm -hmm. are psychology. From the psychological point of view, if one person is doing this and the other person is not feeling well, well, you probably want to have a talk. You probably want to go to the couple therapy or try to figure out a way to go through this and then understand if it's actually what you want. Of course, people have the freedom of want what they want. Some people want 3,000 AIs to be there for them. Completely fine. It's not really against the law. And it, my take on this is also, if it's not completely against the law, it might be a kind of too liberal. Or if it's not against the law, well, nobody's really going to put a pause on it. And it's your personal choice. And if you want to be addicted to specific things, drugs or anything, I'm not promoting any of those. Mm -hmm. But if it's what you want, it's your freedom to do so. And so as any relationships or any intimate relationships that you're trying to build or any relationship you want to build with machines, it might not be the most healthy, is the healthiest to your body, to your mental health. But if this is what you want and you are sure this is what you want, go do it. So this also applies to like, you know, different like situations because I deal with my students, like I have supervisees, I have 10 supervisees that, um, they will have their own projects. Like the relationship between supervisors and supervisees is also very, like sometimes very tricky one. So my take on this is also like, if anything is, um, if we can agree on things, it's really not a, like, it's your freedom to choose to do so. And it's my freedom to agree to do so or not. So yes, I hope it's it seemed, kind of, no, yeah. It was a good answer. It was a good answer. It, it's. It's just something that I think we have to all take a moment and think about. Um, it's also something that I think dating apps should implement as well. If you are using these services, mm -hmm. uh, it, it feels like that's a kind of, it is a deal breaker for a lot of people. Yeah. And it does feel like something that should be talked about upfront. Yeah. That, Absolutely. you know, hey, I'm using XYZ. I just want to know if you're okay with that. Yes. You know, and then we can go from there rather than you find out five months later um i got three thousand ai's out there yeah you're just you I was know, to... experimenting oh oh i would be like interested to know like you know the the physical transformation after having three thousand ai's out there i wonder it's... if it's going to be like a different human almost oh my gosh it's such an interesting thing to think about because mm -hmm. it would be a cool and very unethical experiment to mm -hmm. <laughs> see how someone would fare just interacting with an AI as, yeah. as a partner and someone interacting with a human, like who benefits more and who is better off in the long run. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, okay. Anyway, I'm freaking myself that. out now. I guess the last question for me is what advice do you have for Gen Z? You're a very future oriented person. You're at the cutting edge of technology and society, technology and ethics. So for a generation that is also struggling with being ethical with technology, um, incorporating technology into their respective ethics and politics and such, how would you, what advice would you give them to guide them, to point them in the right direction? Mm, okay. Um, so the biggest advice I feel like I could potentially give right now is um, everything is possible and everything is like, in this process of development. So I would say like, there was a great philosopher once said, um, you were never gonna step in the same water for twice, like for two times. Basically means like everything is, I, I consider life as like water, it's flowing. Like I'm not technically saying like, you know, we're, we're losing time or anything. I'm not creating any anxiety about that. It's more about because it's flowing, we're gaining more time, but also we're losing the time at the same time. Like we're getting older with more experience, but also we're getting older with less time existing in our life. And with the current development, which I do feel very lucky to be existing in this century and this time, we're relatively peaceful where I'm staying at right now. And we have a much more like broader, uh, much broader perspective of viewing life. It gives you freedom to think about what you actually want with all the possibilities, opportunities providing. What can you do about this? It's about 
you might like we we're saying like you know you might start losing things as well you need to get prepared for for example the original the conventional human interactions like might be lost at some point like it might be proved like you know after 20 years people are going to say it's better off to build a relationship with ai with a machine than with a human it might be the case there is no way for us to see it now you need machines you need tests you need you know you need people's wills. You need people's mind to believe in it. So if anything is possible, do not hold too tight on anything. I think it's very important that we don't hold too tight that we're going to hurt ourselves. We're going to hurt like our own mental health or our own physical bodies only because we hang on to the idea too much. So yes, I think that's the major thing that um, I do want to say about this. So yeah. Strong opinions held loosely. At some point, Ernestina, yeah. this was a fantastic conversation. I truly yeah. learned almost too much. My my <laughs> brain is kind of imploding. Where can we find you uh, in the in Web two before Web three? Yeah. Yeah. In Web two, yes. Yeah. Easiest way to find me is Google. <laughs> okay. The biggest <laughs> search engine you will find me, and you'll find the website, my website, and also yeah. uh, my podcast. And also the search research projects, if you're into it. Um, and also YouTube videos, I guess. I'm not What's your um, podcast called? A digitalization. Okay. And it's basically about digital sociology and digital technologies and how it's impacting our daily life. Oh, that's so cool. That's so it's very cool. short podcast as well. Like every episode is very short. I, I tend to keep it short as well. So, Fantastic. Yeah. We'll link everything in the show notes. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Ernestina, you are the best. Thank you.